Good evening, dear aspirants. The results for the fourth and the fifth tests of the Current Affairs Test Series 2020 is out. The top performers of the July Current Affairs Test, that is test number four, are Satish Kumar, Ashwin Kumar, Vikas Yadav. And the top performers in the August Test Series, that is the Current Affairs Test number five, are Karamjot Singh, Z Khalida Banu, and Laishram Neeraj Singh. Congratulations to the top performers and all the best for your prelims examination. The toppers will receive a confirmation email within two to three working days and they will be given reimbursement of rupees 1000. For those aspirants who have not yet registered, note that the registrations for the Current Affairs Test Series 2020 are still open till 4th October 2020. And we hope you are also aware about the All India Online Free Mock Test conducted by Shankar IS Academy. Many of you might have taken the first test that was conducted on 20th September 2020. And the second test will be conducted on 27th September 2020. Those who wish to participate in the second mock test, we request you to register for the same. The registration link is given in the description section and also in the comment section. With this, let us start our today's Hindu news analysis, that is for the date 25th September 2020. The list of news articles along with the page numbers of five different editions is given here for your reference. Let us now begin our analysis. This news article is about Lok Adalat. The news is that a daily wager from the state of Odisha has moved the Lok Adalat against the Prime Minister. Why? Because he has not received Aadhaar card. So in this context, let us discuss about this Lok Adalat from prelims perspective. Lok Adalat is also called as People's Court. The relevant syllabus is given here for your reference. See, Lok Adalat or People's Court is a forum where the cases or disputes that are pending in a court or which are at the pre-litigation stage are compromised or settled in an amicable manner. We can say that this Lok Adalat is another alternative in judicial justice. It is very helpful for delivering informal, cheap and expeditious justice to the common man through the way of settling disputes by negotiation, conciliation and persuasion. To put it simply, Lok Adalat accepts the cases that could be settled by conciliation, that is mediation and compromise. Know that the first Lok Adalat camp post our independence was organized in Gujarat in the year 1982 and consequently if you see this institution started spreading to other parts of the country as well. Initially Lok Adalat functioned as a voluntary and a conciliatory agency without any statutory backing for its decisions. But due to the growing popularity, this Lok Adalat has been given statutory status under the Legal Services Authorities Act of 1987. Now let us see some of the provisions related to the organization and functioning of Lok Adalats under this act. It says that the state or the district legal services authority or the supreme court or high court legal services committee or the taluk legal services committee may organize Lok Adalats at such intervals and places and for such areas as they think fit. Next, every Lok Adalat organized for an area shall consist of such number of serving or retired judicial officers and other persons of the area as may be specified by the agency organizing such Lok Adalat. Generally, a Lok Adalat consists of a judicial officer as the chairman and a lawyer and a social worker as members. Now coming to the jurisdiction of Lok Adalats, it can arrive at settlement between parties in respect of any case pending before any court or any matter which is falling within the jurisdiction of any court and is not brought before such court, that is the pre-litigation stage. And some of the disputes include matrimonial or family disputes, then compoundable criminal offences, then with regards to certain land acquisition cases, some labour disputes, etc. Note that the offences which are non-compoundable under any law fall outside the purview of Lok Adalat. Here the term compoundable means those offences where the complainant can enter into a compromise and agrees to drop the charges against the accused. Whereas there are some cases that are always non-compoundable, that is there is no compromise at all. So such cases cannot be brought before Lok Adalats. This is the difference between compoundable and non-compoundable. Now let us see how a case pending in court is referred to Lok Adalat for settlement. It can be done if the parties agree to settle the dispute in the Lok Adalat or one of the parties makes an application to the court for referring the case to the Lok Adalat. It can also be done if the court is satisfied that the matter is an appropriate one which is to be taken cognizance of by the Lok Adalat. Now in case of pre-litigation dispute, it can be referred to Lok Adalat by the agency that is organizing the Lok Adalat. 
it can also be done on receipt of an application from any one of the parties to the dispute next know that lok adalat shall have the same powers as vested in a civil court under the code of civil procedure 1908 its award is final and binding on all the parties and there is no appeal against such an award that lies before any court of law also know that there is no court fee in lok adalat if any court fee is already paid the amount will be refunded if the dispute is settled at lok adalat so these are some of the important provisions of lok adalat that you need to know from exam perspective now have a look at this practice question let us move on to the next news article now let us look at this opet column which is about the recently passed three farm bills see we all know that there was a lot of criticism and opposition from the farmers on three farm bills that were recently passed by the parliament we have covered the important provisions and the contentious points in our 17th and 19th september the hindu news analysis as the bills have already been passed by the parliament today's discussion is mainly focused on the operational challenges and their impacts on agri economy so let us look at them now the relevant syllabus is given you for your reference before that we will have a brief recap of the three bills in a layman's perspective because there were certain comments that they were not able to understand the essence of these three bills in our previous analysis so let us have a brief recap the three bills are the essential commodities amendment bill the farmers produce trade and commerce promotion and facilitation bill and the farmers empowerment and protection agreement on price assurance and farm services bill now if you look at this first bill the essential commodities amendment bill this will remove certain commodities like cereals pulses oil seeds edible oils onions and potatoes from the list of essential commodities so all these food commodities will be removed from the list of essential commodities now because of this stockpiling of these food commodities can be done this is the advantage in passing this bill now if you look at the farmers produce trade and commerce promotion and facilitation bill it is expected to create one india one agriculture market by promoting barrier free trade and commerce which will be within the state that is intra state and also between the states which is inter state so such barrier free trade and commerce will be done outside the state apmcs so this bill is also commonly called as the apmc bypass bill now if you look at the third bill the farmers empowerment and protection agreement on price assurance and farm services bill this bill is aimed at facilitating the contract farming so it will attract private sector investment in agriculture so these are the essence of these three bills now why we are calling it bill because it has still not yet received president's assent there was a lot of opposition for these bills as many experts are of the opinion that these bills have a lot of shortcomings firstly the apmc bypass bill assumes that the private players don't exist today and apmc is a monopoly and it tries to end this monopoly now this is a wrong assumption because the private players do exist in the agri market and at present if you see they are actually looking into the apmc for a reference price in order to conduct their own private transactions but now if you look at this bill it tries to create an alternative that's outside the apmc in a way it is advantageous why because the traders and farmers now don't have to pay the mandi fees or taxes but there are two problems with this firstly apmcs continue to set the reference price that makes no sense because if the private players are still looking to the apmc for a reference price then the government's idea of getting rid of the inefficient apmcs does not hold secondly large scale trade outside the mandi is bound to happen because new players will prefer to trade outside because they don't have to pay charges and there is also one more possibility where the apmc traders will now prefer to operate outside the apmc mandis for the same reason so if the apmc system collapses then this bill has not provided for any alternative for a large market that can actually set the price signals so if there is no large market which gives an hint to us about the price movement then how can we call india as one market instead of unifying the national market this bill would actually have little bargaining islands where people are just setting prices and as expected this might undermine the farmers interests and in that new trade area that is outside the mandis there is no regulation no data and transactions are invisible now talking about the current apmc system even with its flaws at least there is some recording and grievance redressal mechanisms 
So by passing this bill, it may hurt the interests of the farmers as the trade is not going to happen outside the mandis with no grievance redressal and no recording of transactions. Next, farmers are not happy with the government ignoring their other demands, particularly during this difficult economic situation amidst this COVID-19 pandemic. For example, there are concerns regarding discontinuing the minimum support price. Though the government has made it clear that the minimum support price or the MSP is going to stay, still the farmers are skeptical, that is they are doubting this. This is because certain policy documents talked about replacing the Food Corporation of India and the public distribution system with cash transfers. Now with no FCI in PDS, there won't be any sort of public procurement. And if there is no procurement, then what's the need of MSP? So this is the reason why the farmers are skeptical. And these new bills are also going to promote direct trade with the private players and they will facilitate contract farming. So big farmers may actually start selling their produce to the private players. And there is a possibility that the importance of the APMC and the procurement system will fall and as a result MSP will actually wither away over time. That is MSP will no longer be relevant. And as said before, this concerns all the stakeholders in the agricultural sector, not just farmers. This is because with no MSP and allowing stockpiling, the prices may touch new highs and that concerns everyone in the country. There are even demands to add MSP into legal framework. But unfortunately, if you see, this statutory backing to MSP will be incompatible with the new reforms. Because if we say the bidding in APMCs start at MSP, whereas at the same time in the outside mandis, one can sell or buy even at prices lower than MSP. So having MSP will make no sense at all in the near future. Next if you see there are concerns that the big retail players and corporates would end up monopolizing farm trade like the dairy producers in France and the dairy farmers cooperatives in the United States. Here the authors are of the opinion that in India big players monopoly is going to be less predictable because the big players themselves want to minimize the costs. Generally, in the initial days, big players offer more than market price to crowd out the small players. And once the monopoly is established, then they will decide the prices in order to increase their profits. But in India, this may not be the case according to the authors. Even the big companies will find that it's too expensive to work with a large number of farmers and look for intermediaries who will aggregate the produce for them. So what we are going to see is not disintermediation but reintermediation. That is, intermediaries are going to stay. Even though direct transactions are envisaged between the farmers and the traders, removing intermediaries. It is just that the intermediaries who are now working in the APMCs will now act as intermediaries for the big private companies. And not just that, the traditional marketing channels are very resilient in India. There is some kind of intimate relationship between the farmer and the trader because the money lender and the trader are the same person. For example, if the farmer goes to a trader, it is for multiple reasons, not just the sale of crop. The trader extends credit and has a deeper relationship of trust and the trader accepts all kinds of quality of the farm produce. Now if you ask why the private companies are suddenly interested in farm sector in India, the answer is simple. This pandemic has caused a massive disruption of capital and profits of the private players. But agricultural goods have suffered less because these are necessary items. And there is less chance of revival of demand of industrial goods and services to the pre-pandemic levels at least in the near future. This is why big capital, that is the big private players, are trying to move into the agricultural commodity trade on a bigger scale so that they can recover some of their lost profits. And in India, we always have the problem with maintaining consistency in our policy. It is the same in this case as well. Why? Because the government said that it is removing the regulation by amending the Essential Commodities Act. So the government won't decide the price, the stock limits for certain goods. But you can see that government has imposed ban on the export of onions. So one side it said that no regulation, but on the other side it has imposed ban on exports. So you can see that the policy is inconsistent and this may seriously affect the farm reforms that has been brought in by the government. So this is in brief about the discussion of this OPET which discusses about the operational challenges and the impacts on the agricultural economy. Now have a look at this practice question. Let us move on to the next news article. Now let us look at this editorial which criticizes the recently passed Foreign Contribution Regulation Amendment Bill of 2020 by the Parliament. 
So let us see some of the major amendments that has been made in this bill. In this regard, you need to know about this Foreign Contribution Regulation Act and its provisions which we have discussed in our previous analysis on 7th and 13th September. In our today's analysis, we will focus on the amendments made to this Act. The relevant syllabus is given you for your reference. See, the Foreign Contribution Regulation Act is a legislation of the Government of India which regulates the receipt of foreign contributions or the aid from outside India to Indian territories. The provisions of this Act are applicable to the whole of India and its citizens outside India as well. Now, what are the amendments made to this Act recently? Firstly, this amendment included public servants in the list of entities who are prohibited to receive foreign contributions. Secondly, it amended to prohibit the transfer of foreign contribution to any person. So, individuals cannot receive the foreign contributions. Next, this bill added a provision allowing the central government to permit person to surrender their registration certificate. And next, this amendment makes it mandatory to provide Aadhaar number in case of a foreigner, passport or an OCA card for seeking prior permission or registration or renewal of registration of FCRA certificate. Next, this amendment adds the suspension of registration which can be extended up to an additional 180 days from the present norm of 180 days. So, totally it is 360 days. And also with the amendment, now the foreign contribution must be received only in an account designated by the bank as FCRA account in such branch of the State Bank of India, New Delhi as notified by the government. No funds other than the foreign contribution shall be received or deposited in this account. The person may open another FCRA account in any scheduled bank of their choice for keeping or utilizing the received contribution. Moreover, under the 2010 FCRA Act, every entity which has been given a certificate of registration must renew the certificate within six months of expiration. This amendment provides that the government may conduct an inquiry before renewing the certificate. This is basically to ensure that the entity making the application is not fictitious or not binami application or it has not been prosecuted or convicted for creating communal tension or indulging in activities that are aimed at religious conversion or it has not been found guilty of diversion or misutilization of funds and such other conditions. So, this is in brief about the amendments made to the 2010 FCRA Act. Now, let us look at this editorial. In this editorial, the authors of the opinion that the recent amendments will be highly detrimental to the already downtrodden civil society of India. Here, the author agrees that there are some misutilization of funds, but he is against the government's view that such contributions are misused for religious conversions. He is of the opinion that religious propagation and conversions must not be linked with foreign funding. They should be dealt with the laws which we have like our constitution. We know that article 25 prohibits conversion of another person to one's own religion. Also, India's Freedom of Religion Acts or anti-conversion laws at the state levels regulate religious conversions. If you see many states like uh, Arunachal Pradesh, Odisha, Madhya Pradesh, Chhattisgarh, Gujarat and many other states have such anti-religious conversion law. So, the author tells that if foreign funding is prohibited to NGOs on these grounds, then it could impact the functioning of these NGOs that are critical in helping the poor sections of the society. In this regard, the author also notes the opinion of the International Commission of Jurists. We also have a relevant news article regarding this today. The International Commission of Jurists has said that this new amendment law was incompatible with the international obligations and India's own constitutional provisions to respect and protect the rights to freedom of association, expression and freedom of assembly. See, talking about this International Commission of Jurists, it is an international human rights non-governmental organization that is comprised of up to 60 lawyers that includes senior judges, attorneys and academics who are dedicated to ensuring respect for international human rights standards through the law. So, the aim of this commission is to cooperate with the governments that are committed to improving their human rights performance. It also aims at guiding, training and protecting the judges and lawyers worldwide in order to uphold and implement human rights laws. It also works for access to justice for victims, survivors and human rights defenders, in particular from marginalized communities. So, this is in brief about ICJ that you need to know from exam perspective. 
and it is this ICJ which has said that this new law is incompatible with the international obligations. As a conclusion, what does the author of this editorial prescribe? The author tells that the government should not ignore the values of environmentalism, human rights and civil liberties and in this regard NGOs working in these fields must be supported by the government rather than punishing them by cutting the fund flows. It's not that the regulations are not needed, the regulations are needed but it should not be detrimental in functioning of the thousands of legitimate NGOs that serve the extremely disadvantaged sections of Indian society by supplementing the actions taken by the state that is the government. So a balanced view has to be taken by the government in this regard. This is all about the discussion of this news article. In this news article we have discussed about the recent amendments made to the FCRA Act of 2010 and the opinion of the author regarding these amendments from this editorial. Now have a look at this practice question. Let us move on to the next news article. Now this news article speaks about a technique which has been developed by the Indian Agricultural Research Institute in New Delhi which provides a solution for reducing the stubble burning incidents that happens during the winter months in North India. It is basically a biodecomposer technique which will convert the crop stubbles into compost in a cost effective way. The technology is called as PUSA decomposer. In this technique decomposer capsules have been prepared by this institute. So, four decomposer capsules along with 25 liters of liquid mixture with jaggery and chickpea flour will be prepared and this will be sprayed to the stubble on the field. This mixture is sufficient to cover one hectare of land. So, when the farmer sprays this liquid mix on the stubble, the stubble will soften and it will melt down in the next 20 days. So, the farmer can begin the sowing again and they need not burn the crop stubble. Through this technique, the fertility and the productivity of the soil will be improved because the stubble will work as a manure and compost for the crops. So even the fertilizer consumption will be reduced. So this is one of the innovative techniques developed by the Indian Agricultural Research Institute. You can mention this technique in any of your main answers related to providing solutions to reduce air pollution in India. So this is in brief about this news article. This news article is about Animal Welfare Board of India. The news is that on 6th of August, the Animal Welfare Board of India issued a circular for the closure of all slaughterhouses across India during the Jain festival which is called as Paryushan Perf from 15th August till 20th August. But this circular was withdrawn by the Animal Welfare Board of India on 11th August before the festival. So in this context, the Madras High Court asked Animal Welfare Board of India the reasons for withdrawing the circular. This is in brief about the news. From this news just remember about this Jain festival and now we will see about Animal Welfare Board of India from Pilim's perspective. See it is a statutory advisory body on animal welfare laws and it promotes animal welfare across India. It was established in the year 1962 under the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals Act of 1960. And note that the Animal Welfare Board of India is under the Ministry of Fisheries, Animal Husbandry and Dairy. See, it was started under the stewardship of the late Srimati Rukmani Devi Arundel, who is known for Bharatanatyam and animal rights. This board is concerned with ensuring that the animal welfare laws in India are diligently followed to provide grants to animal welfare organizations and advising the government of India on animal welfare issues. See, initially it was headquartered in Chennai, but now it has been shifted to Ballabgarh in Haryana. So this is in brief about Animal Welfare Board of India that you need to know from exam perspective. Here two things you need to know about. One is that this Animal Welfare Board of India is statutory under the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals Act of 1960 and not under the Wildlife Prevention Act of 1972. This is number one. Number two, the headquarters is now at Ballabgarh, Ariana. Initially it was at Chennai but it was shifted to Ballabgarh in the year 2018. So remember both these facts. Now have a look at this practice question. Let us move on to the next news article. Today that is 25th September is the World Pharmacist Day. We have an advertisement today celebrating World Pharmacist Day which has been released by the Pharmacy Council of India as you can see here. So in this context know about Pharmacy Council of India from exam perspective. It is a statutory body under the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare. It is governed by the provisions of the Pharmacy Act of 1948. Know that the pharmacy education and profession in India up to graduate level is regulated by the Pharmacy Council of India. 
See this Pharmacy Act of 1948 is an act to regulate the profession of pharmacy and to make better provision for the regulation of the profession and practice of pharmacy. So for this purpose it envisaged the formation of pharmacy councils and based on this act we have the Pharmacy Council of India that was constituted in 1949. So what are the important objectives of this Pharmacy Council of India? First of all, it regulates the pharmacy education in country for the purpose of registration as a pharmacist under the Pharmacy Act. Then it regulates the profession and practice of pharmacy. Now coming to the functions and duties of PCI, it prescribes minimum standard of education that is required for qualifying as a pharmacist. It also ensures uniform implementation of the educational standards throughout India. Then the Pharmacy Council of India frames education regulations prescribing the conditions to be fulfilled by the institutions seeking its approval for imparting education in the pharmacy. It also inspects pharmacy institutions seeking approval under the Pharmacy Act to verify the availability of the prescribed norms. Another important function is to approve the course of study and examination of pharmacists. If the approved course of study or an approved examination is not in conformity with the educational standards of PCI, then PCI is empowered to withdraw the approval. Then the PCI can also approve qualifications granted outside the territories to which the Pharmacy Act extends, that is the approval of foreign qualification. Apart from all these, the Pharmacy Council of India also maintains a central register of pharmacists. So this is in brief about the Pharmacy Council of India. Here you should not confuse the role of the Pharmacy Council of India with that of the Central Drugs Standard Control Organization. If you look at CDSO, it also functions under the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare, but it is the Central Drug Authority for discharging the functions assigned to the Central Government under the Drugs and Cosmetics Act of 1940. Now if you look at CDSCO, it is headed by the Drug Controller General of India and some of the important functions of CDSCO are regulating the import of drugs, approval of new drugs, approval of clinical trials etc. And it also enjoys the regulatory control over the meetings of Drugs Consultative Committee and Drugs Technical Advisory Board. And these are the important functions of CDSCO. So don't confuse PCA and CDSCO. Now have a look at this practice question. Let us move on to the next news article. This news article mentions about G4 countries. The news is that the G4 countries have been pushing for expanding the United Nations Security Council and bringing in more reforms to United Nations Security Council. In this context, try to know in brief about the United Nations Security Council. The five permanent members are USA, Russia, United Kingdom, France and China. And there are 10 non-permanent members who serve two-year terms and they are represented from these five different regions. So two countries represent Asia. As given in this news article, India has been elected for a two-year term as one of the 10 non-permanent UNSE member. Its term will begin in January 2021. And India along with Brazil, Japan and Germany are called the G4 countries. These are the four countries that are seeking reforms in the United Nations Security Council and also reforms in the permanent membership of this UNSC. This news article tells that China is against this initiative of G4 for bringing in UNSC reforms. There are indications that China is not considering India and Japan and Germany to be a part of the permanent membership in the United Nations Security Council. So try to know about G4 countries from this news article. This news article mentions about one of the constitutional office, the Comptroller and Auditor General. It has recommended an investigation into the purchase of five unmanned aerial vehicle engines by the Indian Air Force, which happened in the year 2010. Here, this issue is not important from exam perspective. You need to know about the Comptroller and Auditor General from prelims perspective. We have discussed in detail about the Comptroller and Auditor General, about the term of office, the removal of CAG in our 6th August the Hindu News Analysis. We request the viewers to have a look at this analysis to know in detail about the Comptroller and Auditor General. Now let us move on to the practice questions discussion session. This question is about Lok Adalat. Four statements are given and you need to choose those statement or statements that are incorrect. 
it is a voluntary and conciliatory agency without any statutory backing for its decisions this statement is incorrect it has statutory status as per the legal services authorities act of 1987 now look at the second statement it tells only cases which are at a pre litigation stage can be brought to lok adalat for settlement this is also incorrect now look at the third statement it tells that lok adalat shall have the same powers as are vested in a civil court yes this statement is correct and the fourth statement tells that there is no court fee in lok adalat yes this statement is also correct so here the correct answer is option a 1 and 2 only since you need to choose those statement or statements that are incorrect this question is about international commission of jurists it is a two statement question and you need to choose those statement or statements which are incorrect look at the first statement it tells that it is an intergovernmental organization under the united nations this statement is incorrect because we saw that it is a non governmental organization not an intergovernmental organization now look at the second statement it speaks about the aim of icj it is a correct statement it aims to cooperate with governments committed to improving their human rights performance again here you have to choose the incorrect statement or statements since the first statement is incorrect here the correct answer is option a 11b now look at this question on animal welfare board of india it is a two statement question and again you need to choose those statement or statements which are incorrect first statement tells it is a statutory body established under wildlife protection act of 1972 it is incorrect it has been formed as per the provisions of the prevention of cruelty to animals act of 1960 not wpa 1972 now look at the second statement it tells that this animal welfare board functions under the ministry of environment forests and climate change it is also incorrect it functions under the ministry of fisheries animal husbandry and dairy Here both the statements are incorrect, so the correct answer is option C, both one and two. This question is about Pharmacy Council of India. Which of these four are the functions of Pharmacy Council of India? Prescribe minimum standard of education required for qualifying as a pharmacist. Approval of new drugs and clinical trials. Testing of new drugs to approve the course of study and examination for pharmacists. As we saw during our discussion, approval of new drugs and clinical trials and testing of new drugs. are functions of the central drug standard control organization if you know this fact you can easily arrive at the answer which is option b 1 and 4 only the first and fourth statements are correct here now look at this question about conference on interaction and confidence building measures in asia this question has been framed based on this news article where india and pakistan have accused each other at sarc meeting and also at this conference on interaction and confidence building measures in asia meeting so in this context try to know about the member countries of both these regional groupings you know that sarc has eight members which are india pakistan bangladesh sri lanka nepal bhutan and maldives and afghanistan Now if you look at this conference on interaction and confidence building measures in Asia it has 27 member states and five members of SARC are also members of the SICA they are Afghanistan Bangladesh India Pakistan and Sri Lanka so the remaining three members are not members of the SICA they are Bhutan Nepal and Maldives so the first statement goes incorrect here all the members of SARC are not members of the SICA Now if you look at the second statement it tells that SICA was first proposed by Indian Prime Minister PV Narasimha Rao at the 47th session of the United Nations General Assembly in 1992 know that it was proposed in this 1992 session of UNGA but it was first proposed by the president of Kazakhstan who was Nur Sultan Nazarbayev in the year 1992 In this context know that the SICA is an intergovernmental forum for enhancing cooperation towards promoting peace, security and stability in Asia. So both the statements are incorrect here and you have to choose those statement or statements that are correct here. So the correct answer is option D neither one nor two. So from this news article try to know the member states of both these regional groupings. Now look at this mains question the question is in the last few years government has brought many measures to increase the farmers income and to boost farm productivity discuss it is a 10 marks question and you need to answer this question in 150 words please post your answers in the comment section we shall review and give suitable suggestions and feedback within a reasonable time frame with this we come to the end of the analysis of all the news articles taken up for today's discussion and also the practice questions discussion session 
If you like the video, press the like button, comment and share and do subscribe to Shankar IAS Academy YouTube channel for latest videos and updates. Stay focused and motivated friends. Thank you.